Welcome everyone to British International Investment and to this private sector development research workshop which is organised with the Private Sector Development Research Network, the International Growth Centre and CEPR's Structural Change and Economic Growth Programme, otherwise known as STEG. My name's Paddy Carter, I am the uh, Head of Research here at BAII. Um, I should start by letting you know this event is going to be recorded. So the goal of the Private Sector Development Research Network is to put researchers in front of practitioners who might actually do something differently as a result of learning from their research. Uh, I'm very pleased to see the train strikes don't appear to have depleted the audience uh, too much. I'm pleased to see a great mix of researchers and practitioners in this room. Uh, I know there are many more watching online. The research presentations here today are going to be watched today by staff from development finance institutions across Africa, Europe and North America. Uh, the time difference is a bit harder for Asia, but I saw that a few dedicated souls had registered from there too. So welcome to everybody online. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to be hosting uh, STEG here today because the focus of that research program is so close to what we are concerned with as development finance institutions. Uh, I particularly like they've coined the phrase uh, micro to macro development. Uh, and that about, is about research that tries to understand how perhaps sometimes small changes in certain areas of the economy might add up to something larger in the long run. And as DFIs, we make micro interventions, but we are asked to deliver macro outcomes, the most important of which is poverty reduction. And uh, we need to understand which micro interventions are likely to have the largest macro effects because we want to improve how we target our investment efforts. And we also need help explaining what we do to a skeptical public. Uh, whenever we appeal to uh, indirect and long-run effects and start saying, well, we're doing this thing over here because we're hoping that something over there is going to happen, uh, we often get accused of practicing discredited trickle-down economics. Whereas, of course, what we're really trying to do is accelerate the structural transformation that took place in every country that has made the journey from poverty to prosperity, and that is needed today to eradicate poverty everywhere. So this afternoon, we're going to hear five research papers that were chosen because they have something new to say about how that happens, and which we, will, we hope will be useful to development finance institutions and private sector development policy more broadly. But before getting to those, uh, I'm delighted to be joined by three eminent panelists to discuss what, how we use evidence in practice, what we need, uh, and, and what we get. So can I ask you to um, take your seats, please, panelists? Uh, so I'm joined here by Professor Adnan Khan, who is the Chief Economist and Director for Economics and Evaluation uh, at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, he's seconded from the LSE, where he was previously the Research and Policy Director of the International Growth Centre. So throughout his career, he has been concerned with promoting development through policymaker and research collaboration. Uh, Denis Medvedev is, currently leads the IFC's Economic Policy Research Department, so he's responsible for frontier analytics on private sector development. Uh, he produces flagship reports and country, country private sector diagnoses and sector deep dives. Um, his own research is, has been on firm growth and productivity. And uh, Liz Lloyd uh, is the chief impact officer here at British International Investment. Uh, I shan't say that Liz is responsible for impact here at BII because we all like to say that we are all responsible for impact at BII, uh, but the buck stops with her and the impact group that she oversees incorporates all the impact management and measurement we do, all the work we do around individual transactions, our ESG team, our business integrity team, and specialist teams that look at gender and diversity. Liz was previously the CEO at Standard Chartered Bank in Tanzania, and her career uh, in UK government included being the Deputy Chief of Staff to Tony Blair. Uh, right, I'm now going to go over there, because I'm going to start by asking a few questions, uh, and then we are going to open up to questions from the floor, uh, there will be microphones, so please wait for the microphone to reach you if you raise your hand um, before you speak. And I've got a laptop, and I'm going to be taking questions online. So uh, if you're watching online, please put your questions in the Q&A, and I will pass them on to the panellists. Well, uh, Adnan, I wanted to start with you. Um, so as I mentioned in the introduction, you've spent your entire career really trying to get policymakers to listen to uh, research, and I guess vice versa. Uh, can you just tell us uh, your reflections on how that works and when it succeeds and when it doesn't? Thank you, Perry. Uh, first of all, always a pleasure to be here at BIA in front of such an august uh, audience. 
Uh, yes, I've spent all of my life uh, either in the policy world, sitting on the other side of the table, uh, or in the academic world, uh, uh, in the policy world, both in a developing country context and now in a developed country context. And I, so reflecting on how do we make the picture from both sides, and maybe from, from outside uh, looking at it more objectively, um, Getting evidence into policy or thinking about like more informed policy is, is a process, not an event, and there are challenges everywhere in all contexts, whether it's a developed country, it's a developing country context. Um, the familiar challenges that we all know, challenges of horizon, or pol any policymaker worth his salt would want some briefing to be or any evidence to be presented yesterday. So there are timing mis uh, or horizon mismatch. There are also incentive mismatch uh, about publication um, cycles, about the incentives faced by different people, and also how uh, different sides view the world. However, I've also seen a um, successful example like where these are not barriers. One can, whatever constraints one can see on, uh, on policy and evidence uh, meeting each other, all of these constraints can be overcome by either individuals uh, building longer term relationship by either structuring those contracts so that they have not only long term deliverables on deeper questions that we want to know answers to, but also have like intermediate deliverables, also other things that match more the policy cycle. Uh, it's also important to have roles of uh, call it intermediate organizations. I was part of one, IGC, Federal BIA, STAG, many, there are many others who like, uh, because there are high transaction costs involved in this, like uh, this relationship, who can like bear some of those transaction costs and maybe reduce the burden for each individual researcher to do that. Not easy, and I'm, if I'm honest, I've sat in too many meetings where the discussions are more like, uh, what do you think, what do you think? And everyone thinks uh, or, or tries to second guess what the top most person or the senior most person <laughs> is thinking. Uh, and I've also sat at meetings where people challenge each other uh, with evidence analysis. I think the deeper question is, how do we do it not as a one short transaction, but in a way like endogenize it? In other words, where the supply of evidence is endogenous to the demand for evidence from policy actors and others. Uh, so it's not done on a one-off per person, so it is, if I'm very honest, like I also do research with uh, policy actors and uh, um, longer term, large scale field experiment with, with uh, policy actors. In my policy roles, I also try to convince like, uh, or work with them on setting up an ecosystem for doing that. I found it easier to convince individual policy makers in my role as a researcher. Found it very, very hard to convince like entire organizations to become like or endogenize like the value of this kind of like learning and evidence on an ongoing basis. So that when one person, or especially the top person leaves, there's still like uh, 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 the demand and need for evidence is endogenized, is institutionalized in that way. So that's an ongoing challenge everywhere. Uh, there are good lessons. I'm sure my colleagues will have other things to say. Yeah, thanks. So we're, we're on the demand side, uh, Liz, and we use quite a lot of evidence uh, here at BII. So w uh, what do you want out of it? Well, I think there's probably kind of two levels that we wanted at. Um, the, the first is, you know, so uh, we invest uh, equity, we invest debt, we invest directly, we invest through funds, we invest in a number of sectors. And we, and over a number of horizons. So, I mean, at base we want to know where should we put our, our dollars. And that, by the way, they are dollars, they're not local currency. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, where, and that is like the basic question. So we want as much advice, really, on how do we think about that asset allocation. And there's obviously not a simple answer. There's obviously not a simple equation. And I'm sure you can come up with many uh, equations. But uh, you know, that, that's the question we interrogate every day uh, at that level. And then the second is, is really, you know, when you get down to the next level, let's say your, 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 your field is equity investment in infrastructure. You want again to know what is sort of more or less good or you know what is how should we think about this? So it's really about the sort of the relative uh, uh, opportunity and where should we really be focusing? So that's one that's really the very sort of big question. And uh, 
quite often we don't have sort of choices other than that. We don't have potentially sort of two chicken farms to invest in. You know what I mean? It's like a chicken farm or a water project. So, you know, that, that's the sort of reality at, at some levels. So it's answering those questions. Uh, and I would say that we really want to use evidence. So we are we're very keen uh, to know our impact pathways are robust. <coughs> You'll have seen probably the long run evaluations we published where we set out our evaluation pathways and there were little arrows where someone has sort of had a look at how credible those are. So anyone who can kind of sort of lean into those questions and provide more evidence of those impact pathways would, would be doing us a massive service uh, and would lead to different decision making. And I suppose the other one, which I think goes a, a little bit uh, to what's just been said, is about uh, kind of translation, engagement, sort of talking our language, uh, the, you know, you said sometimes sort of intermediated groups are, are helpful. I mean, it's in inevitably the case that specialists talk their own language. Uh, and, you know, a lot of my professional career has been on that cusp uh, and trying to kind of translate one person's language into another. Um, so, you know, just, I, I guess, you can only learn where the other person's coming from by talking to them, hence the, the value of these kind of events. But, um, you know, really trying to understand how we how we use research, for example, uh, it, I think is extremely valuable. And then engaging with lots of different people. So engaging with the public, engaging with other participants, um, because you know, we need to build up this, um, this sort of knowledge of, of, of what, what's good, what's better, and what's best. Uh, I mean, we've got the International Development Committee just now uh, taking an in inquiry into development finance. So I don't know how many people sort of put in their views, but I mean, that, that's an absolutely crucial kind of uh, <coughs> venue for influencing uh, the future direction. Thanks. And, and Dennis, you've embarked on um, expanding the IFC's capacity to uh, produce primary research in-house. So can you tell us a little bit about why you, what you've been doing? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're in the process of setting up the research department uh, at the IFC, and this is, of course, an, an, ongoing, an ongoing process, process that involves not only getting more people into the department, but also thinking about topics and, and struggling with some of the, in the issues that uh, Anand and Liz have already mentioned um, in, in, in their responses. I guess I see the, the value of, of building in-house capacity in, in several different ways. I, I think one, and again a little bit reacting to, to, what, to what I heard from the panelists, is you, know, you do need uh, the research foundation to inform the strategy of an organization. Um, this is not necessarily something that you can take various inputs from the stock of knowledge that exists out there, right? You sort of need to customize it, adjust it. Think about some of these trade-offs uh, that, that can arise, right? You, you, you know, you may have a clear goal in terms, you know, you talked about ultimately poverty reduction, but are we, you know, are we thinking about short-term horizon, long-term horizon? I think research can tell us what are some of the things that can work really well in the short term. We can also think about things that will work really well in the longer term, but how do we combine all of these things is not necessarily something one can take from one particular paper. So having uh, the capacity to, to translate the research into institutional strategy is, is, is really important. The other part of it is you know, think about questions that are a little bit less academic but super relevant, and I, th and I think this is probably where the discussion um, that to follow will go in terms of, you know, there are certain things that are underexplored, there are certain things that are under-researched because data may be missing, because the questions may not necessarily be, or people may not think of them as publishable questions, so there, there will be gaps in research, but, but, but that may be the area where one needs to enter, again, to provide, to provide some advice, to inform the investments or to collect data and, uh, and generate these kind of dynamics which will then get researchers into that. And, and lastly, you know, I, the, the third point that I would raise is this idea of you know, connecting really the people who work on the frontline um, operations in a place like the IFC with the research community. Many times these links are not immediate. Many times the researchers don't, you know, wouldn't know exactly what kind of questions to raise. Many times people who are in charge of providing investment or advisory activities won't know who to ask or, or what exactly the question to ask. So again, having an in-house team who understands both research and the realities of, of, of where operation, where, what operations need is, 
is kind of critical to this matchmaking process, which ultimately, you know, what I hope will generate much more robust collaboration, not only within the IFC, but with the academic community more generally. Adnan, we were talking a little bit at lunch uh, about how I, I remember that DFID really enthusiastically embraced, uh, I guess, its complexity economics and, and growth diagnostics, uh, because both of those things end up telling you what to do. I mean, they say, this country, uh, it would be a good idea if it uh, promoted investment in this specific um, sector. But at the same time, I don't know whether I'm being unfair, but maybe both of those things are a little bit on the fringes of uh, academic economics, or at least they're not, you know, getting published in the, in the top journals necessarily. Um, so, I mean, is there anything, that, maybe just to reflect a bit more on this kind of mismatch between incentives uh, uh, and what the academics face, and then the, um, the hallmarks of useful uh, investment from a, a practitioner's point of view. Yeah, so that's an ongoing challenge, obviously, in, 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 in economics or in any social science, and also a relevant question for donors or for any policy actor. I think economics has also dealt with it, uh, is, is continuing to deal with it. In other words, like matching the incentives of uh, researchers with the incentives of the policy actors. Uh, and partly it's a question of selection. So some people do care about and academics do care about like uh, the longer term impact of their own work or what happens in the real policy world. But also like thinking of more institutional approaches of that uh, is how do we create institutions that help better deal with this translation function on both sides. Like uh, policy makers have questions. I go a lot in Africa and almost everywhere the question is how do we become a middle income country in 10 years or 15 years? How do we have growth rates of 10% or, or even more? That's not a, that's a good aspiration, that's not a research question, that's not like a, even a policy question in that sense. Like, so how do we translate that uh, high level ambition or aspiration into, into concrete research questions and then translate those research questions also into what does this mean for policy? And uh, I think there's a role for all kinds of research, so of the research of the type that challenges questions are deeper thinking about certain questions, even though that may not be immediately policy relevant because that's foundational, that changes everything, uh, how we view. And then there are other kinds of other researchers who would take that research to, to more or less the application stage. Uh, what does this mean to apply to, to the current, um, to a particular context? And yes, whether it's growth diagnostic or other or particular approaches, uh, I wouldn't say like those are the only approaches or the research done in the academic world, um, especially of the type of people who are here and I will welcome them, encourage them to do more of uh, this type of research, is um, uh, even if it is extending the frontiers of our knowledge, it is doing it on policy relevant questions which either they themselves or others and um, Ideally, relating it to the, what I was saying earlier, if there is, if the take up of evidence is institutionalized within policy actors, both in donors, uh, but also in recipient countries, then partly that translation function is also done there uh, in terms of taking findings and how do they translate to, uh, to that particular context. There is also tension between generalizable cross-country knowledge and evidence and also knowledge that applies to one particular context. Uh, and knowledge to be to be relevant for for policy has to be more robust, rigorous, but also like um, relevant or meets the context of the, in which it has to be applied. So there are all kinds of challenges. I think uh, we're making a lot of progress. I think the people over here, BII, STAG, others like Pedal and others, are part of the examples. And FCDO is also playing a big role in terms of like call it like a market shaping uh, interventions to not only do it ourselves, but also to encourage more norms and more mechanism for doing it on an ongoing basis. Maybe, could I yeah, add a couple of thoughts to that? So I think first of all, you know, you presented a, a very legitimate challenge, but in some ways I think, you know, it's also a bit of an oversimplification. So, you know, when I think about things like complexity, right, yes, it, or growth diagnostics, you may, one may think that it provides clear answers, but there are various approaches to measuring complexity and, and within people who do that, they're kind of raging debates about who, you know, what, what, what are exactly, exactly the ways of, of mapping out those pathways. Um, so, so I think once one starts digging a little bit below the surface, lots of questions arise. And, yeah, you, you may, and you may think that, okay, I know that these are the 
potentially the next few sectors that should be on the horizon, but it doesn't mean that you have any insights in terms of how exactly you get there. And, 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 and it is only by getting really into the details and talking to people who really understand these sectors, you may discover that indeed there are certain core capabilities of transitioning from one thing to another, which may exist in other places that have done it, which may not exist in your particular setting. So I, I think it's a, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a stretch to say that these things do, do deliver very, very specific and implementable recommendations. It may seem like that, but, but many times there's a question. At the same time, I feel that you know, whether it is, it is these kinds of approaches or you know, some, of, some of the other research, which at first glance may seem less applicable, um, you know, ultimately the value of that is the approach, in, you know, kind of using data in a rigorous way to think about decision making, right? And that applies whether one thinks about growth diagnostics, whether one thinks about RCTs. And, 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 and really if one thinks about companies and how they make their decisions, for example, right? It, it's true that, you know, we may not, they may not call them RCTs, but companies, at least companies that perform well, do engage in lots of experimentation. They sort of try various things. They see which one, you know, they, they see which one works, uh, and and then they implement these decisions. And companies that don't do it probably should. So I think, you know, there's there's a, there's a lot of value in bringing in this kind of more evidence-based approach to making decisions. Uh, this, this kind of idea that you have a lot of data, especially today, you know. Companies, governments, uh, institutions have lots of data at their disposal. And as long as you have access to clever people who can think about various ways of using this data, it can really help. I'm going to open up to the floor in a minute, but I just wanted to stick with this theme a little bit on, on I guess, what we might call gaps. Uh, I, mean, I know from personal experience that we can't always find the answers to the questions that we want answered. Liz, is there anything else you could say about it? why is it that we sometimes come up blank? Well, I, uh, I don't really know exactly why. Uh, uh, I mean, it could be for a number of the reasons that have been um, uh, mentioned. But, you know, if you take, for example, trade or trade in food, so, you know, you go around and, and people search for the, the answer, you know, should we be in with the current, um, uh, you know, food security uh, issue, you know, should we be facilitating more import of of food through trade finance facilities, you know, in the short term, or potentially, you know, looking through other mechanisms, and then, you know, people have a look around and they search the available um, public resources. They search, um, you know, VoxDev, which is a great resource for this kind of intermediation, uh, and you know, try and find the answer. And you see some glimmers. You know, maybe there are adverse effects for some sections of the society, and then you're basically trying to piece it all together. I suppose what we want is the kind of simple answer. Uh, the sort of yes or no or kind of on balance. So, I mean, I don't know that there is uh, uh, a kind of quick fix to that, but that's, that's our use case, which is, you know, do we, should we lean into the problem by investing more in this dimension? Um, so uh, that, that, those are the questions that we look at. And indeed, they do have all of these different time horizons, because if you're using something like a trade finance facility, which has a very short tenor, that's like immediate. And if you're supporting a port infrastructure that's obviously extremely long term. So these questions uh, are, are ones that we look at and then sometimes you find these extremely, um, what looks like is, you know, you look at the top, this is me and by the way I'm not an academic so I just sort of tend to read the abstract and the headline and as soon as we get to the, 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 the sort of anything in Greek I'm gone. Uh, but um, uh, you know, and, and then it's just basically it's not replicable. You know, it's like the one example, and it probably isn't from one of our markets. So you just, you know, your heart, you know, your heart sings to start with, and then it sort of plummets because you don't know if it's very kind of reliable. So, yeah, I, I, I think there's a, there's a question of relevancy, and I think there's a question of just the right level that is too narrow or kind of extremely macro. So I think we're looking for the, the middle section. That's the bit that feels to be most missing. I'm going to abuse my position as a chair a little bit uh, to bring up a, a, one of, I think one of the most striking gaps, which is which is blended finance. So the entire policy world has convinced itself that the secret to um, getting the trillions of investment that we need across Africa and Asia are, is essentially um, small capital subsidies, uh, and that's going to be what it takes to um, you know induce loads of private investors to uh, flood in. This completely dominates uh, the, the debate on sort of development finance, and I personally very rarely read anything about it uh, from academics. I don't know, Dennis, whether that's something the IFC is trying to 
uh, work on? That's maybe a bit of an unfair question. Is that one of your? <laughs> It, it, is, it, is a big, it is a big picture question, right? I'm, I'm not going to tell you that we have an answer or, or, or that you know, we're likely to come up with an answer in the short term, but it is definitely a question that is, that is of a lot of interest to us, right? I mean, obviously, it comes in through various angles. It comes in because blended finance is part of, of what we do. Um, you know, we, 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 do, we do leverage donor funding in terms of <clears throat> making sure that we're able to provide capital in areas where kind of purely uh, purely in private terms, you would not be able to deploy sufficient financial resources. Um, I guess, you know, more to, more to answer your question in terms of research directions on this, you know, one, you know, obviously everyone understands that the scope of challenges and the range of, of challenges that, that we face will require much more than public funding will be able to meet, right? And, and of course, also many countries are dealing um, with with, with situations in, um, in terms of more more limited access to, to sometimes to capital markets, certainly higher levels of debt. So the ability to deploy public funding uh, is certainly lower today than it were uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, right? So challenges are greater. The ability of the public sector to step in is perhaps lower. So obviously the, the solution has to come from, from the private sector. And, but how do you do that when um, you know the market prices are such that you're not going to see the, the kinds of investments in the, in the sort of places you need, well, that, you know, that's where the blended finance comes in. So it's a, so it's a little bit of argu an argument not on, you know, this is exactly what will work, but this is, you know, this is the only way we can sort of square the, the challenges with, with, with the current situation where we have now. In terms of research, I guess a couple of things to, to mention. One is, you know, there, 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 there is a stream of, uh, stream of research out there in terms of thinking about what are the returns to, to impact investment, right, more broadly. Um, there, you know, there are a few, few papers out there, and then hopefully more will be coming up, and we're interested in pushing this further. Where, you know, essen essentially what you see is, is that you don't necessarily sacrifice return by carrying something about, about something more than, than, than just you know, financial returns, right? So kind of... Some of the impact investing funds certainly are not doing worse than, than, than the benchmarks. You have to be careful how you define benchmarks, etc. But certainly there are arguments there that you, know, you can have these multiple objectives and, and still generate uh, a <clears throat> return at least comparable to, to another actively managed fund which doesn't have um, environmental and social goals, for example. So I think that's one important insight is, is, is that you, know, you can do at least as well. In some cases, you can do better when you, when you have these kinds of goals in mind. And I think that's encouraging, and, 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 and that is a good argument for thinking about um, this kind of blended concessional finance. The other part is kind of where, where you deploy, which, you know, again, research is really not there to tell us exactly, and I'm not sure we will ever get to that stage, but we can think at least about conceptual frameworks, right? We can think about the types of problems which may require higher or lesser degree of concessionality. We may think that certain, certain projects which, which you know, do benefit currently from blended finance may be able to be done on a commercial basis within a few years or just with, with, a, you know, with some minor advances in technology, whereas some of the other ones really re will require continuous inflow. So I think having a, a clearer conceptual framework that, 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 that tries to map, you know, if you will, the degree of concessionality to the types of challenges that one faces is something that's definitely needed and, and, and we are trying to think about it. Well, I hope that some, sparks some thinking in the audience because I'm, I'm now going to uh, turn to the audience um, and see if anyone's got any questions. Do we have a mic? Around. Uh, Tony Clamp. On blended finance, uh, there are pockets, you know, some bigger, some smaller, around to, you know, mobilise uh, private sector funding, all that uh, wall of money which uh, all these projects need. Um, but the big source, of course, are the multilaterals, uh, the IFCs and the BIIs and many others which to date have not embraced candidly from their balance sheet uh, blended finance. Presumably, uh, a bigger piece of work, to your point, the panel's point, is needed uh, uh, to demonstrate that impact. There are groups such as Convergence, which you know, um, which do fantastic work. Uh, I'm not clear myself as to whether they've you know, been able to grasp, if you like, the, the measured impact. But presumably, that sort of research is needed to, to actually persuade the multilaterals to to convert their business model to, uh, to provide blended finance. Comments? That's a great question. Should we collect a few more and then we can have a, the panel respond? So I think right next to Tony. Um. 
Thanks very much um, for the interesting panel so far. My name is Valerie Muller. I'm from the EBRD. Um, I'd like to ask um, about the role of uh, strategic priorities in impact investing. So how can we square sort of um, strategic objectives like achieving different types of impact? Like for example, with regards to diversity and inclusion or in the green spheres with um, you know the academic research uh, that doesn't necessarily have such a thematic um, focus often with regards to thinking about these equations and and conceptual frameworks for for measuring different um, types of sources of impact. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, um, Sam Attridge from ODI. Um, really enjoyed listening to you. A question like from the research community. I'm um, just thinking about blended finance. One perennial challenge that we face as researchers is access to data. Um, how blended finance is actually being used. And I mean, I've tried many, many times to access data from DFIs on this. And I think that constrains kind of independent research in this area. So one thing to think about is how better data can be made available to the academic and kind of think tank community to uh, undertake research to support you in your endeavours. So I don't know whether I should regret having mentioned blended finance. You see, it, it's, it's fired off everybody on the, on, the, on the policy side, on the practitioner side. So, um, oh yeah, sorry, I didn't see that. Just because it, it hinged on it. So the, the, um, in the idea of fostering, uh, you know, collaboration between academics and, and um, uh, international finance uh, institutions, um, this, the panel says, you know, what do we need and what we get? But I think there's also this question that's already come up, is sort of like what, what we can offer. Because th there is some challenges that some of the approaches are less publishable, uh, some of the existing approaches are less publishable. So I guess there's, a, there's also this idea of sort of like what, what can researchers gain from this um, Why don't we pause to see if the, because otherwise if I was on the panel, I would definitely have forgotten the, the first question that was being asked by now. So can we, um, uh, who, anybody want to, Dennis, do you want to start your next? Sure, so Take one sure. and then we'll move down. Yeah, so I'll, uh, instead of trying to answer one or two in, in depth, I'll just try to give a couple of quick reactions to each four and uh, to all of the four and then have, um, have my colleagues expand a bit more. So I guess, you know, so f first of all, maybe, maybe to address a little bit head on, I think that, you know, the, the question there, I, I, I think there's, I, I, I do think there's some intrinsic challenges even when it comes to governance of, of multilateral institutions in terms of deploying blended finance. So certainly in the case of the IFC, by our articles of, of incorporation, we're required to make a profit in our investments, right? So, so we, do, we, we do need to think about investments that will go into places where private capital is, is likely to be undersupplied, but still do it in a way that uh, ultimately is not is not loss making because again because of how we're set up and because the World Bank Group as a whole relies on the money that IFC generates in order to subsidize, for example, <coughs> loans to some of the poorest countries in terms of contributions to IDA. So it's it's not necessarily an inconsistency, but it is a it, it is a very fine balance that one needs to take. So this is you know and, and I think I can probably say as much as we we are in active discussions with our board to think about. You know the kinds of challenges that this creates, and, and how we we address them. And there are some, you know, there are some very interesting solutions that are being proposed. But it's not a very it's not a very easy balance to to, to strike, right? For for obvious reasons, um, I think you know when it comes to diversity uh, and inclusion, th th there are some very interesting pieces of research right out there in terms, uh, you know, so, so, so certainly on gender, in terms of how you know, for example, the decisions take place. Um, on, on teams that are comprised of, of men and women, the extent to which women tend to be more risk averse than men. So, 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 so I think there's a lot of, um, again, in, 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 the, in the fields where we're active, there's a, there's a lot of interesting research insights on how to have teams uh, that, that, for example, promote more, more effectively diversity and inclusion goals and at the same time create better performing companies. I, you know, I think there are some really good examples there. Uh, in terms of the data on blended finance, again, I don't want to, um, Make definitive statements, but I know that a lot of uh, a lot of the data, at least on the IFC side, in, including you know, for example, in some of the green projects and the, <laughs> and the constitutionality element, element of that, are available through some of the APIs. So, so it's, and, and, I, and I'm always a big uh, big supporter of getting of getting more data out there. Um, 
And in terms of the kind of you know what's there for for, for, for researchers, I think there are a lot of you know really interesting questions that, that, that researchers can still can, can can still answer. I mean, again, there's there's there are huge opportunities in terms of you know working with um, working with companies, potential beneficiaries of BI or FC investments to answer lots of interesting questions, which can uh, lead to lots of publishable insights and at the same time some actionable strategies. Liz and Adnan, have you got anything you'd like to? I mean, I'll just add on the, the, question, the sort of thematic priority question. So, the, I mean, this is something that we are very keen to sort of hear more about, or rather is one of the questions <coughs> we would like to know more answers to. So, indeed, we, you know, there is quite a lot of evidence that more diverse and more inclusive uh, senior management teams lead to better risk decisions and some on productivity, but actually that's a bit mixed and on small businesses it's a bit mixed. So I, I would say there's, there's so much more out there that we would want answers to, uh, you know, whether, it create, create, whether companies with, with more women at board and or management level uh, bring up more women in the workforce, bring one, more women to senior leadership. Again, I think that's some somewhat mixed evidence on that, whether there is better uh, female participation in the workforce, whether there's better female participation in the supply chain. So from a development impact perspective, not just the, the, the or from a DFI perspective, not just a better run business, a more productive <coughs> business, but what are the, the, the impacts on, on people? And you know, even if we wanted to link it to, uh, to, to climate and uh, ESG factors, you know, are these better run businesses from a kind of carbon perspective? Uh, or any other uh, dimension you want to look at. I mean, I suppose uh, the question on access to data is a very good one, and it's not, it's not, um, uh, you know, we don't also have that in our gift. I mean, this isn't necessarily our, our data either, it's the company's data. We're an investee in data, and sometimes we're an intermediated investee in a company. Um, so, I mean, that is really about, I think, collaboration. I think going back to your kind of A-B tests, RCT tests, I mean, there is, and you do see it a little bit with some uh, investees that they, they begin to see, you know, the benefit either from a, 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 a sort of commercial point of view or, or and or from a positioning, a kind of reputational point of view, being able to explain in a rigorous way that has been tested because there is quite rightly a focus on ESG and other rigor. Um, that you know, if you have someone in who has tested your data, you are therefore able to rely on it more. So I think that can happen, but that is, I mean, that's a sort of a relationship and a kind of, um, you know, you've got to have that conversation and that the amount of trust. Uh, so I don't think it's really as simple as sort of switching on a data set and sort of switching it off. It's, it's a little bit more um, sort of long run than that. And maybe that goes to the point about, you know, how do we all kind of, uh, become more learning organizations and I can assure you we do always have that conversation or not, not necessarily always but it's like on our list of conversations to have which is you know and, and maybe it comes after a bit and then of course if it only comes after a bit then you're like as it were quite rightly well we don't have the baseline you're like well I'm afraid we don't because we've been invested two years already but now we have the relationship so um, yes yes so I agree it's easier sometimes to articulate the question than always come up with the or the means of having the answer. Yeah, let me take up uh, Joe's question and maybe. Uh, I think researchers have a lot to offer, but also a lot to gain from this process, um, both in an instrumental, but also substantive sense of getting good research done, but also getting good impact, uh, provided they are willing to engage with the policy world or with the world of practitioners. Uh, both individually, but also by creating maybe systems, maybe organizations and others that are able to do it on a longer term basis um, to reduce the transaction cost for individual researchers. A huge gain from, from the policy side, uh, whether it's a question of where do we allocate our resources, how do we match these priorities, that's a question of allocation and, and e e economics provides both the framework uh, but also the thinking to help decide on this question. Or the question of are we actually allocating resources or is there misallocation? That's more of an empirical question. Um, two questions like um, are we focusing even on the right questions? Uh, are there productivity wedges out there? Uh, 
questions of structural transformation, questions of like uh, private sector investment and others. I think the policy process has a lot to gain. The research is also both uh, in terms of like their publishing um, and others have a lot to gain. Um, I think the gains are even bigger on the policy side, I would say. Um, first of all, even in terms of defining, helping define the question, unpack the question and, and helping us get a magnitude of the problem. So I've, just to give you one example, I work on the question of public procurement for, I don't know, seven or eight years. Uh, impact evaluation, where we change, work with the government in changing their, the mechanism through which they decided on, uh, procurement officers decided on, uh, on uh, procurement by giving them incentives or autonomy. Uh, the biggest impact of that project was what we did in the first few months by uh, capturing value for money, by helping decide the question of is there misallocation? Is there variation in the prices paid by different public bodies for exactly the same good? Basically using regressions to like, uh, to, to pin down like uh, each public good, like paper, or laptops, or whatever, like those public goods into their essential attributes and then to get a measure of, uh, an objective measure of value for money um, in terms of like, price paid, quality adjusted unit price paid for that good. And then we could say that like uh, different public bodies were paying wildly different prices uh, for exactly the same good, for exactly the same A4, 80 gram per square meter, like paper or any other public good. That itself, that like basic work, which is not like research per se, like publishable research, had much more of an impact in terms of like triggering conversations in government about uh, uh, why is there inefficiency? Why is there variation? Why are some people, are uh, some offices systematically doing better or worse than others? And what should we be doing about it? Uh, so the actual eventual research also had like a, for us like bigger gain, but also for the government. But even that first process of like, call it like problem diagnosis uh, also <coughs> had big returns. I also support the issue of like a data. Um, obviously there are like practical concerns, I think, for most of DFID or FCDO funded project, we do have these uh, um, data sharing clauses for any project funded by, by us, like I uh, think data, subject to all of those like, I, I work on taxation that you're talking about business like a taxation, sharing data is even far more of a concern in, in taxation, there are hardly any governments who are willing to share data. But when I talk to policy actors around the world, I think the, one of the biggest lessons is in terms of setting up an ecosystem and an environment for promoting uh, uh, use of evidence, use of research, which will ultimately benefit them. And one of the biggest component of, of that is making data available. So yes, anonymize, yes, subject to all of those things. Once you have data, like uh, that itself is one of the biggest incentive for researchers, both uh, within the country, internationally, uh, to come and work on those data sets. That's one of the biggest incentives that you could give, independent of any other money or any other resource that you have. We've got some questions that have come in online and then I'll take some, some, some more in the room. So I think, I hope I'm interpreting this correctly. I think one, we've got one question here about whether it would be fruitful to try and organize research around specific countries and specific sectors. And that might be something that the IGC has tried to do. If the question there is why not set your mind to the question of what should Ghana do now as being something that we might a way of organizing research. We have another question coming in about um, if I want to do research on blended finance, where do I get the data? Uh, good one. Uh, IFC, uh, I mean, maybe your leaders on transparency with uh, around your blended finance activities, but I, I think that's going to be a difficult one to answer. And then I think we have a question here about, I think it's whether the digitization of the economy um, is helping produce uh, New, new forms of data that we're suddenly going to be able to say much more about uh, what we do because of uh, the growth of the digital economy. I'll stop with those three and then I'll come back for one last round in, in, in the room. Um, uh, Adnan, do you want to respond on the sort of country sector uh, lens of uh, organising research? Yeah, we obviously we want to work both on countries as well as sectors and that's how like our own funding, our own like uh, FCDO funding is also organised. Um, there are interesting questions in both. Uh, there is some element of generalizability that we learn from one context and you take that context to others. I am a big fan of localization, but localization in terms of like uh, having a voice in terms of like uh, uh, 
applying that that analysis and use of evidence to the local context, but not in terms of like localization, in terms of lowering of evidence, like anything goes like um, um, in that sense. Uh, in other words, like investing in both sectors as well as on countries. Uh, but when it comes to making particular decisions or supporting policy decisions in any country, um, uh, knowledge from other contexts and from the, that thematic context is hugely important. But also having knowledge or uh, applying that knowledge to that particular context, given the constraints that that country or that context is facing, uh, is, is even more important. But also thinking of knowledge and learning not as a one-shot transaction, um, not thinking of a, as it as an event, but as a process that you need to like continuously. And thinking of continuous learning and adaptation, um, and how do we build systems? How do we, as donors and other organizations, build systems that support it for countries and policy actors and business actors to to be more responsive to, to both help create, engage with, and also use that uh, that process of continuous learning and adaptation. So maybe. Just if I, if I could add just a bit on that. I think, Patty, the, the, the really important angle for me in this is around access to data, right? And, and we all agree that data are important, but I think, you know, to really get the kind of detailed data um, which can help us answer really complicated questions and to get researchers involved, one, one, one needs to get quite detailed. And in that regard, having this kind of country focus is really important because you know if I want to get VAT transactions data in a particular country, it's with very few exceptions, it's very unlikely that I'm just going to you know send an email and get access to the data. It requires actually building relationships with uh, the statistical agencies of these country to make sure that you kind of pass through all of the all of the different steps that would be required to 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 get access. So I feel like. You know, in addition to everything that I said, you know, once you once you have the kind of country focus, you develop these relationships over the medium term, then you can actually have the ability to answer much more complex questions by virtue of having built those relationships and perhaps by having invested in the capacity of these countries or you know the regulators in a particular sector to collect and use the data in particularly meaningful ways. Liz, do you want to come in? Or shall we? Uh, well, I would just, I mean, we, we well, we, uh, FCDO uh, and us, um, have taken a sector approach to our evaluations. And I, I think I mentioned before, we have a, a basically a theory of change, which is then kind of tested. And I think, I mean, for us, there's a lot of value in taking that sector approach um, because it's, it's how we organize ourselves, it's how we think. Uh, so I think there is, it's very much, again, back to the audience. Uh, you know, if you take an impact investing fund, I mean, not us, but just I mean that has a particular like financial uh, financial institutions. Uh, you know, they are as well, only exclusively going to want to look through a financial in inclusions in financial institutions lens. And so, having a country perspective will be, I mean, less useful to them. So, I mean, I think it really is what is the market out there, and and and, and who's going to use it. Um, and then, just on the digitization front, I mean, I think we probably, or certainly I. Uh, I'm sure there is uh, scope there. I mean, we, we haven't kind of cracked it yet here. Uh, and so I suppose that is something that we'd be, like again, really keen to know if that is a, a way of cutting through some of these data issues and making it all smooth. But, uh, uh, you know, if people have expertise, I think we would love to talk because uh, uh, we'd be a ready partner, but not necessarily the most expert. Oh, we have 10 minutes before we recaffeinate. So, um, <laughs> Margaret here. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Can you? Is this working? Hi. Uh, so, first of all, I want to commend uh, BII for hosting this event. I think it's incredibly important to bring us all together and also to focus on the role of research in building the impact investment market. So, thank you. Um, and the panel has been fascinating so far. My name is Gila Norwich. I'm from the Global Steering Group for Impact Investing. And um, we are definitely very focused on the role of research in market building. And I think that what I wanted to say is more a comment or an observation rather than a question, but I'm very interested to hear your views on this as well. Um, and that is that, you know, 
I think a lot of the statements on the panel have been about using data to inform policy, using data to inform decision making, using data to inform our own uh, strategies, potentially as investors. But I think it might be worth uh, considering that research may have other roles. So Adnan, um, uh, Adnan you, you touched upon the process. So in terms of, uh, you know, you use, we wanted to, to do research on a certain topic, but in the process you realized that the data wasn't uh, uh, uniform or well, uh, well you know, uh, managed or coherent. And so the process was useful. I think also research can be uh, a tool for persuasion. I think it can also be used potentially uh, as a tool for bringing new voices to uh, the fore where we're trying to build a, a movement or a market that's very inclusive and a lot of the times uh, the data is less important but actually the process is more important than the fact that you've actually been able to involve different voices. Um, uh, and, and, and yeah, just, just interested to, s to know from your experience whether you've come across uh, instances where, and also, you know, a lot of the comments have taken on, uh, take, uh, have go gone with the assumption that we're all rational beings, that once we see the data, we're going to make the right decisions. And I don't know if that's always so, po so I, don't, I don't know if that always happens the way we would like, but wondering if you've, from your experience, seen other uh, uses for di for for research for evidence for uh, the process of research that has been impactful in your work and that has helped to move the needle. Can you get the mic over here, please? Oh, thanks. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Let's go to Margaret then, because she uh, yeah, and then. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Maggie Mc Maggie McMillan. Tufts University. Um, thank you so much. I, I, I wonder um, how much you guys are um, working with local financial institutions, either development banks or commercial banks. And I'm asking that because, you know, I worked, um, I've done some work with the National Microfinance Bank in Tanzania, and my foot in the door was, was the CEO of the bank who was seconded to that bank from Rabobank um, in the Netherlands. And, um, there is just a wealth of information there, like it, it's huge scale that we could use to answer so many amazing questions like the returns to lending to mid-sized firms versus the returns to lending to larger firms and so on. But um, it's hard to get access to those information and also, I mean, for you all, it seems like it would be, I mean, they kind of know what's going on on the ground. So I'm just curious to know whether <laughs> what, what you all are doing in, in that respect. So hello, um, I'm Alexandros Rogusis from the IFC. Um, I have a question for all the panelists. So um, d diversity in the economics profession is a, is a huge debate at the moment. Like it has been raging for many years, right? To what extent do you see um, that being part of the equation of making research more policy relevant? That's one question. And second, going back to the incentives question that Annan raised, uh, what could be like low-hanging fruits to change the equilibrium, if you like, of competition within the economics profession that could lead to more policy-relevant research or more valuable contributions, if you like, to questions that we have? Thanks. I think we have a bit more, we have more questions than time, I'm afraid. We have five minutes left, so I, I must give the panel a chance to, uh, to respond to what they can and then, I guess, make their closing remarks, if they have any. So um, I'll just, Adnan, do you want to start? If yeah, you've got to start, uh, maybe from... Um, yeah, so, to, so on your last question of uh, diversity, um, so you had diversity and incentives. Uh, on diversity, yes, so diversity is on multiple margins, so gender, race, others, but uh, all of them are important and we have already seen evidence within economics of having, um, it, it's not just a question of agency, but it also creates like substantively different uh, have implications. In the world of development that we are talking about, uh, I think the uh, one of the key dimensions of this diversity is local capacity, uh, local voices. Um, that's a goal that FCDO also has pursued. I think others are also pursuing. That's an ongoing challenge, not an easy challenge, but. 
I, I don't think we'll be able to, to address in, the question of international development without having addressed the question of building organic local capacity, not just in terms of implementation, but also in terms of knowledge creation. Local capacity, which is also linked to international, I don't know, academia, think tanks, and others. Uh, we're making some progress on them. And wherever we see, uh, we also see a huge difference that it makes. Like, uh, it is really substantively, but also in terms of policy-wise, important. In terms of incentives, yes, uh, perhaps, like, uh, I don't know what the right institutional mechanism is, of what is the optimal mechanism for creating incentives within the world of economics, for creating more of those policy. I think, yes, we need to maybe increase the incentives. Uh, but there is also the risk of like a race to the bottom, like we may also, uh, too much incentives may also, uh, in other words, that may or may not be, we should also think of either motivation or mission match, uh, uh, if people are buy into a mission, so that itself is part of the return. Um, so an open question, I don't have a perfect answer for this. Uh, there was also, so okay, so let me. So I, I, I suppose the the question about sort of where does research fit, I guess, kind of culturally or something. I mean that that's something that we spend quite a lot of time thinking about, which is basically, are you know, are we a learning organisation? You know, do we do are we prepared to look at things which don't work and um, you know stop <coughs> doing them and, and do more of the things which do work? And that is, I mean, that that is really important. And I think that some of the the FCDO funded um, FI evaluation at, came at a very opportune time as we were thinking about our strategy. So it allowed us to uh, sort of, you know, exactly feed it right into into the strategy process. Um, so that was a very live example of putting research and conversations and having, you know, it's not simply that you know you get a piece of research and you sort of completely as it were stop everything you've been doing for five years and sort of do that you, of course it goes into a big set of we're doing lots of things that are very complex and which take a lot have lots of other considerations like risk appetite around I don't know, business integrity risk or environmental and social risk and returns um so yes um but i, I do think that going back to the original, also one of the early points, which is about kind of translation and just having some kind of common language is really important on this because you can involve more people in absorbing research if it's in a kind of digestible format and it has the sort of so what uh, to it. Um, and then just uh, one point on um, sort of local FIs and uh, yes, we do try and work with a number of our portfolio companies in a deep way. And I suppose there is also, I mean, we haven't really talked about this, there is also the resources of us, I mean, like financial resources to pay, uh, or whether through foreign office or ourselves. I mean, those are also, I mean, limited, not limitless. So uh, we do do some of these, but uh, we also have to be very thoughtful about um, uh, about how how confident we are, uh, essentially, that it will, it will lead to a product that is usable. Uh, and for all the reasons we sort of talked about at the beginning, uh, you're talking that's not automatic, you know what I mean? So it takes a lot of work to make sure it is something that is usable and and then that it is robust when it comes and et cetera, et cetera. And so as I know many of you, because you all have done it with one or other bus, uh, IFC or others that, you know what I mean, need to say it's quite a process uh, to get that, that sweet spot. Great, so Alex, maybe we'll discuss your question during the, the coffee break, but, uh, Two, two thoughts on, 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 on the question there. So I think that you know, the big value of research for me is answering questions that really need to be answered versus necessarily the questions that are being asked, right? Um, so, so in a way, I think you know, when, what, once one really engages with a researcher, one may actually realize that you need, the, the question is different from what was originally asked and it takes you in a different, in a different direction and that's particularly useful. So I think that, that process is, 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 is really important. I would though push back a little bit, I think on the, on the issue of data because I think data is absolutely critical. So there's, as you know, there's a big debate about the influence, for example, that the tech, the big tech sector has, right? And, and we all know that they kind of lead in terms of lobbying amounts that, are, um, that, that they're spending. But I think the, the another aspect that goes a little bit less notice is also 
even unlike some other sectors, you know, the tech is incredibly selective in terms of what kind of data they provide and who they provide it to. And that, and that ends up also a very powerful way of influencing the narrative. So I, so, so I would say that you know, the data still remains extremely critical because un unless you have it and you have equal access to it, it, it becomes very difficult to do proper research and, and, and then you start wondering about uh, the directions that, that the research that does take place goes. Um, and then just quickly on this, so yes, uh, li likewise we do engage with uh, local financial institutions. I do think that um, you know, it, it doesn't happen systematically yet. It happens more on a case-by-case -case basis. This is something that we're working um, very hard in the IFC to kind of do more. We've been discussing with Chris earlier this morning different initiatives there precisely because I, you know, I see it as a challenge as an opportunity. It's a challenge because for the majority of companies, opening up their data to outsiders is a little bit of a non-starter. They, you know, they, they see the potential risk and, it's, and they cannot clearly articulate the benefits. I think this is where there, there are benefits, of course, and particularly kind of my answer previously. You know, if, if that bank engages a consulting firm, that consulting firm will give them answer to the questions that are being asked, whereas getting a researcher involved may actually lead them in a different direction and answer some of the more interesting questions, questions that have development implications which otherwise would not be addressed. But that matchmaking process has to take place, and this is really where I see the role of institutions like BAI, like IFC, uh, because we can play that, that, that connecting role. We can reassure the companies um, that, that they Data would be handled in a way that's safe, and, and at the same time, it can be it can be a benefit to them. Thank you very much to all the panelists. We're going to break now for 15 minutes for coffee and tea. So for everybody online, we're going to be back at 12. Oh no, I mean 2:15. I forgot the wrong time there. 2:15 when we are going to be uh, deconstructing the, the missing middle. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Ben. <laughs>